Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Robert Lawrence, and I'm going to be moderating this session. As you will see, uh, certain of our participants are uh, on their way. Uh, apparently, there uh, are certain impediments to traffic uh, currently that are preventing them making uh, access uh, instantaneously. But uh, as they arrive, uh, we will be absorbing them into our discussion. Uh, we have an important topic today which is basically uh, the global trading system. What's striking if you look at the performance of the global trading system is that it is somewhat paradoxical because at one level it's actually been remarkably robust. We've really put the trading system under huge stress uh, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. And while we have seen some protectionist protectionist measures being adopted, I think uh, many people have actually been surprised at the restraint which many governments have shown. And the e economists are starting to do some research into why has that restraint occurred. And, and one of the things that the research is pointing to is the fact that today we operate global supply chains. And so we are highly interdependent and from a political standpoint, this seems to have made the system somewhat more robust. Nonetheless, uh, if we look at the trading system, we do see that um, certain parts are flourishing. And one particular part that is flourishing is the regional. We're seeing large numbers of regional agreements being uh, negotiated between major participants in the trading system. But at the same time, the contrast is with the multilateral system, where the negotiations are, quite frankly, at an impasse. So there's the striking contrast. Something is driving countries to negotiate free trade agreements. Protectionism has not risen. And yet, at the same time, the multilateral system is not operating well. So what I hope to do in this session is to explore this strange contrast. Firstly, what explains the difference in the outcomes that we're seeing bilaterally and plurilaterally versus multilaterally? And then later, what I hope to ask is, how could we improve the multilateral system to really restore its centrality? So I'd like to start off with uh, Pascal Lamy, uh, who's um, uh, sitting um, uh, at the end. Uh, after that, we'll go through uh, our, uh, our panelists. Uh, gladly, we've been joined by um, uh, Mr. Sharma, uh, who is the uh, Minister of Commerce and Industry and Textiles from India. Uh, next to Pascal uh, Lamy, the Director General of the World Trade Organization. Uh, we have uh, uh, Karel uh, de Gucht, who is the Commissioner of Trade for Europe. Uh, on his uh, right is Ron Kirk, the Special Trade Representative from the United States. Um, uh, we then have uh, um, uh, Federico Curado, who's the President and CEO of Embraer uh, from Brazil, who's our representative of the private sector. And then we have uh, uh, Gita Wirjawan, who is the Minister of Trade from Indonesia. So let's start with uh, uh, Pascal Lamy, please. What explains this contrast between regionalism on the one hand and the negotiating processes in the Doha round? Well, Bob, I, I believe there is not as much as a contrast as uh, you just painted it, which I understand uh, is necessary for uh, moving the discussion uh, forward. First, because you're right, there are many bilateral agreements being negotiated. But bilateral agreements being negotiated is not bilateral agreements which are concluded, first. And second, bilateral agreements which are concluded are not necessarily bilateral agreements which are used. We've published these numbers in the World Trade Report, which we issued last July, with all these bilateral trade agreements all over the place, not more than 15% of world trade 
is de facto regulated by bilateral agreements. And why? Because business is reluctant to enter into the preference game in that it implies certificates of origin, red tape, so there is a huge bit of process which in fact hampers the effectiveness of bilateral agreements. Now, but true, politically speaking, it's, it's a fact. And this is, by the way, among the major players. And that's one of the problems of this proliferation of bilateral agreements, uh, which is that if I'm US, EU, or China, and I negotiate with a 20 million developing country, uh, we know what the balance of forces is, which in doing so creates a risk of debalancing the rules in favor of the big ones or leaving aside a large number of poor developing countries who have sort of no capacity to negotiate bilateral trade agreements, whereas around the WTO table uh, they have their say. Second, I will totally agree with you, and it's obvious that the rules-making function of the WTO is, for the moment, not working. We have rules, but we haven't yet succeeded in some areas in improving them, uh, in adjusting them to uh, the realities of what trade is today. But that doesn't mean that the multilateral trading system doesn't keep a comparative advantage vis-à-vis -vis bilateral deals. We have a big comparative advantage in monitoring, surveillance. We have a big comparative advantage in dispute settlement. We have a big comparative advantage in technical assistance and aid for trade. So you're right, for the moment, for the moment, the rules making of opening more trade we have a problem in the multilateral trading system, which is due not to technical issues, which is due to political problem. If you go bilateral, uh, you can uh, pick and choose your partners. When you go multilateral, uh, by definition, uh, you have to agree with everybody, and that's maybe for the moment where the difference lies. Well, thank you. Um, Carl de Gucht. Um, we've heard from the Director General that the problem is political um, when it comes to negotiating in, in the WTO. From where you sit, uh, would you agree? And in a sense, what, what I do notice is the vibrancy of your initiatives when it comes to negotiating with many other trading partners. So, so how do you experience this contrast? What is it that's leading to this difference? The problem within the WTO is certainly a political one, um, and it has a lot to do with uh, the fact that uh, the Doha round was uh, initiated uh, more than 10 years ago, and in the meantime, the world has uh, changed uh, dramatically. Uh, the emerging economies uh, have largely emerged, um, and uh, especially China, but also Brazil and India have become uh, or fierce competitors in almost all of our markets. Now, the, the, the starting point of the Doha round was an asymmetry in efforts. And uh, the whole political discussion is about uh, to what extent can that uh, asymmetry in efforts continue? Uh, do we have to narrow the gap, and how can we narrow the gap? And then you have uh, different appreciations. Some say, look, at, look, as long as the gap isn't bridged, uh, we are not making agreements. And others say, look, uh, let's... Uh, Let's nevertheless try to, to, uh, uh, to make a compromise. That, that's a big political discussion. So uh, some say it's because now there are more members in the WTO and, and it's not any longer the, the, the four that dominated. No, I mean, if there were a, a possibility to, to reach an, uh, an agreement, to, to uh, uh, negotiate an agreement between the, the, the major uh, developed economies and, and the BRICS, we would get to something. But... At this moment in time, this uh, cannot, cannot be bridged, and uh, we will see whether it, it will be the case in the future. Now, about our own initiative on, on bilateral uh, agreements, there are two reasons for that. The one that I'm just explaining, but there is another one, that we want to engage uh, in a way 
uh, with strategic partners that is much more uh, deep and comprehensive, which means that, for example, also regulatory approximation is part of, of, of the agreement, uh, so much, far, much more far-reaching than you could ever aspire uh, within the WTO. So there, is, there are two reasons for that. Thank you. Uh, Minister Sharma, uh, I, I'd like you to pick up on this, on this contrast uh, between the multilateral and the bilateral. And you have currently, presumably, negotiations taking place with Europe, which are uh, going towards deep and comprehensive. And yet in the WTO, we don't seem to have seen movement at all, if you will, and certainly in, not in that direction. So where, from, we, from where you sit, how do you explain this, this contrast? You see, first of all, uh, let me put it that I agree in principle with Pascal and Karel de Gucht that it's a political issue. Political issue in the sense that the leadership of countries, heads of states and governments, and the ministers who are engaged in the process have to have absolute clarity and courage to take some decisions. To say that the changing world has changed the developmental dimension of the debate, uh, with all respect, I will disagree there for three reasons. Before I answer your bilateral and plurilaterals, first, we are talking of making a distinction between the developing countries. Already a distinction has been made in the developing countries block, that is of the LDCs. And there is a broad consensus amongst the developed and the developing countries that the LDC must get a package, they must be assisted, and this is what we discussed today. Secondly, we are engaged in frank negotiations, but to say that the emerging economies are present everywhere, the Doha mandate was to correct the historical imbalances and distortions. Now, for a country like India, I'll say, we are not an economy which is gaining from global trade. We have le less than 2% of the share of merchandise trade. Our goods and services trade put together is barely 4%. Now, we are home to 20% of the world's children, 17% of the world's population, 1.2 billion people. Should that be our share, fair share? But to say that, you know, because we are emerging, now should we remain submerged? That's my second question. Thirdly, where America is, the per capita income is 48,000 US dollars. UK is 36,000. Average Europe is 36, 77,000. We are $3,000. We are still home to one third of the malnourished children of the world. We are trying to create wealth and redistribute, reinvest, so that we can empower our people. So to say that, you know, Ch China has a different dimension, but they too has some of the same social issues and challenges. Brazil too has. Africa has. Hasn't trade been a major source of dynamism in India? Hasn't well, but still I have said that you look at our share. Yes, sure. uh, when uh, it comes to... But if we to, look at your growth? No, uh, let me tell you, when it comes to India's external engagement, economic engagement, that has grown. And the share of trade in proportion to a GDP, which was barely 24-25%, today is over 50%. But at the same time, there is enormous pressure on our trade account itself. Our trade account deficit is huge. We are not a trade surplus country at all. And we are mindful, acutely so, of our challenges. And when there is a pressure on the trade account, and which is more so, difficult now after what has happened in the world in the last one year with the skyrocketing fuel prices and we are primarily an oil and gas importing country, fertilizer importing country. So it is impacting our agrarian economy, it is impacting our current account deficit. So let we, I would like to urge everyone that when we are analyzing this and also our position, it should be put in a, this wholesome perspective. We are back home still not where the per capita incomes of the developed countries were there before the First World War. The others may be somewhere there in 1940s, uh, but we are not. So we are trying to reach, we are trying to move forward, but that we can do 
only if we get a fair share. So there has to be a balance. Because the last observation I have to make on this, that we are talking of countries engaged in difficult and complex negotiations coming from different levels of development, different levels of challenges, but we have a common aspiration because we, are li we live in an integrated world. So that's why we have to find some solutions and move forward. Well, thank you. Ron Kirk, uh, you've participated in both kinds of negotiations, recently concluded successfully and indeed implemented a range of free trade agreements, now doing uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. What do you see? Um, uh, why, are you more hopeful in that direction, or could, could you also do the Doha round? Well, we've certainly been more productive in the bilateral fora, and I guess to try to lighten the mood a little bit at the risk of, of, of uh, being non-responsive, when you started out asking why the, I think, the explosion of bilateral agreements, one, I just think it's a, it's a more practical path, uh, whether we like it or not, to an immediate challenge among all of our economies responding to this particular global economic uh, crisis that some of us have come out of, many of us are struggling with, uh, it's a fairly um, efficient way to use trade to help spur economic growth and grow jobs in a more direct path in which you can control. I think notwithstanding the differences and the nuances you've heard from many of us, uh, having now been in this job three years and met and gotten to know all of the people on stage, all of us share a very deep and abiding commitment to the integrity, to the need of the um, World Trade Organization. Each of us, if we had our preference, would rather have trade rationalized in a multilateral form for the reasons you'll hear our, our business friend talk that would be uh, much more sane. Uh, but I think people do bilateral trade, if I can use the story, if I can be so crude, for the same reason uh, in my part of the world we grew up, we had a fellow by the name of Willie Sutton, who was a notorious bank robber. And he was very proficient at robbing banks, but equally proficient at getting caught. <laughs> um, and so he literally, he, he, I mean, he would rob a bank, he'd get caught, he'd rob a bank, he'd get caught, and he went to jail, and finally the judge says, Willie, why do you keep robbing banks? And he said, Judge, that's where the money is. Um, and I don't mean, you know, to be flippant, but short term, I think you're going to see more and more countries turn to bilateral regional engagements because of the difficulty of finding consensus among 153 very diverse economies. And I would say to the defense of the, the uh, WTO, like other global forums, uh, at least we do move forward in some areas. It, but whether it's climate talks or others, we've seen how difficult it is to find consensus. And I think the reality, given the current global macroeconomic environment, countries, leaders have a responsibility to use all of the tools in their economic toolbox. The good thing is trade has credentialed itself as a way to be able to move that needle, to create economic activity and create jobs. So... Basically, um, you're saying that's where the money is. Well, I mean, um, look, in short the sense term, that the company, where, what are the companies saying to you? Companies are saying create opportunities, take cost out of the system now. Consumers increasingly, and again, it depends on where you sit. Uh, and I wish, you know, if you're my colleague from Singapore, in which trade is 180% of your economy, you don't have to go sell trade to the public. But if you're a trade minister from an economy like the United States, in which trade is only 13% of our GDP, but contributing heavily, but which more and, Amer more and more Americans, frankly, question the value proposition of global trade. Um, a Minister Sharma talked about their deficit of trade. I don't need to go into our balance of trade. But frankly, more and more Americans of all persuasions believe that we have swapped jobs for cheaper T-shirts and iPads and say, you know, at the end of the day, I need a little more of that. Uh, and whether, no matter where you are in the world now, just showing up and saying trade is good doesn't sell with the public most places. You have to be able to demonstrate how your trade policy sustains economic growth with a direct line, not a dotted line, to job creation. So um, as we hear about this um it's interesting that you mentioned the iPad. 
And uh, Pascal Lamy had a fascinating op-ed piece in which he brought out that this product, which comes labeled as made in China, actually has more, a, a huge amount of American value added in it. And it comes from many, many other countries. The reality today is that we live in a world of global supply chains. And I would be very interested, um, uh, uh, Mr. Corrado, in, in your take, uh, as you operate your, your aircraft business, which we think of as a Brazilian aircraft, uh, how much value added do you actually have that comes from Brazil, and how dependent on you are, on glo are you on global supply chains? Well, uh, we are very global by nature. We are, uh, just for, for, uh, to make the, the general information, we are in three businesses, air, commercial aircraft, business aircraft, and also the aerospace and defense. And uh, the aerospace and defense business is, nat is global. So the supply chain is global. So the number is something about 60 to 70 percent, depending on the product that we, we source, we outsource. So the value added actually in Brazil is 30 to 40 percent. This is the same number, a very similar number to Boeing or to Airbus. And that says a lot about uh, bilateral, multilateral. Companies uh, we, which are fundamentally trying to defend themselves in their domestic markets, they tend to push probably, as Secretary Kirk said, uh, towards bilateral, where the money is, more pragmatic approaches. But I would, I would try to make a, present the other angle. Uh, the more global we become, and of course the Doha, Doha round uh, is political for sure, uh, the, the, let's say the, 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 the stall of the, of the discussion process. Uh, the, the, the governance mechanism does not help, in my opinion, the single undertaking and need for consensus and everything, so that I, I'm no expert, of course, but uh, it is very difficult to, to find consensus in everything, and uh, without that, we do not move. So maybe capturing partial agreements uh, in the WTO, in the scope of Doha round, could be a, a way to go. Uh, but uh, companies which are global, they would prefer, as we are frankly pro-multilateralism, uh, we believe it's the only way to have a real equilibrium in the international trade. So I, what I hear in this conversation so far is that um, when we look at the multilateral, we have an intrinsic problem. We have decision-making by consensus. We have a hugely diverse group of countries. And in a sense, they have very, very different needs and demands. Meanwhile, there are a lot of pressures from below, from the companies, to be able to integrate. So there's an inherent tension here. And I think those are important takeaways as we try to look forward. You mentioned a, a, a kind of a, a, a more plurilateral type of approach. So I, I'd like to hear from other people, but I want to give everyone a chance to talk first. Um, is that the way forward? A, a more um, multifaceted WTO that actually can accommodate uh, uh, both deeper agreements for some and yet, nonetheless, have common obligations for all. Please. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm in principle in support of what Pascal has said uh, in terms of multilateralism being the way forward. By way of the principle of single undertaking, it is the only way to make sure that everybody gets treated fairly. But unfortunately, as, as I said earlier today, it's sort of like these 150 and odd countries are sort of like driving in their different cars, each one of which might have its own GPS, but some may not have GPS on board. So some may know where they're going, but some may not know where they're going. But we're just going to have to wait for somebody that has a better mode of transportation that can basically provide the leadership and take everybody else forward. I think there is reason to feel optimistic about getting a multilateral approach done for everybody. But it's a question of timing. I share the view of Anand Sharma in that, you know, India has its own concerns in, in terms of 
they're having a GDP of $3,000. Indonesia is not far off from there. And Indonesia is a country that's probably not in the same category of an emerging economy as China, Brazil, and India would be in that they have a lot more educated people. They have the ability to produce airplanes, iPads, computers, and what have you. Whereas we're only at the level of being able to produce footwear and garment because we have not produced equally the number of PhDs, masters, and bachelors as we might see in those three other countries. We have issues to go forward, but we do have the desire of wanting to go up the value chain. And to the extent that that gets understood in a plurilateral or a multilateral type of an approach, I think there is a way to go for countries like Indonesia. So in the meantime, I think you're bound to see the seduction and addiction to bilateralism and regionalism at the rate that there is no political leadership that basically can think pragmatically, realistically, and reasonably for us to move forward maybe little steps at a time as opposed to being superly ambitious about some of the bigger goals that we've already articulated earlier. So um, what I hear emerging, you, you call for leadership, but I also hear hints that there may be something wrong with the structure that is, that is requiring um, uh, all to accept all obligations. I think fundamentally the structure is the right structure. Doha was designed to make sure that the interest of those coming from the developing economies does get attended to. And that, I think, is the right structure for anybody that comes from a developing country. But there is another part of the structure which I think has to call upon the voices of those from the more developed economies to make sure that this give and take approach gets done going forward. Craig Emerson, uh, it's good to have you with us. We appreciate your uh, arrival. Um, I know that Australia um, is, is, is playing in both areas, the regional and the multilateral. Uh, as you look forward, what kind of changes would make the multilateral system more attractive? Uh, well, if I could um, uh, give my apologies for being detained, but I can report that the Occupy World Economic Forum <laughs> Uh, movement is not yet fully convinced of the benefits of free trade. <laughs> uh, uh, so I did make it. Um, I'd also, as a doctor, uh, uh, say this about the Doha round. Uh, it should not be declared dead. Doha is not dead. It's not alive and well. It's alive and unwell. Uh, but I think there's enough life in the Doha round to persist with it, but uh, realistically after 10 years this patient is, is pretty feeble and uh, simply uh, pressing on with the current uh, approach doesn't look capable of e yielding the sorts of results that we need. Uh, so I don't think it's fundamentally a problem that there are 153 members or soon to be 157. I mean, uh, in the uh, Uruguay round, there was well over 100. Uh, you're already way past um, a sort of critical level at which uh, um, complexity is a defining feature of uh, the negotiations. It was then, it is now. Uh, but the sorts of um, ideas that um, Pascal has uh, been talking about, and Australia certainly has been doing to break the round up into more manageable parts, uh, build confidence. Uh, I think it lack, we lack confidence now in the capacity of the Doha round as originally conceived uh, to deliver results. And maybe uh, modest early returns now uh, are the way to go. And this is the sort of discussion that we've been having. Uh, they may not seem to be monumental in their own right, but they are confidence building and uh, send a message to the world at a time when there's so much protectionist pressure that we can do it in some uh, easier areas, but nevertheless important. 
uh, such as trade facilitation, tra such as the accession process for least developed countries. Uh, they're two examples uh, that seem to be good candidates. But you're right, we are, are pursuing uh, regional agreements through the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, we think APEC is potentially a vehicle um, that to which the TPP could uh, expand over time. All the members of uh, the TPP are members of APEC. Um, we have bilateral negotiations underway. But the benefit of the um, multilateral system is one that you mentioned on the way, and that is that businesses themselves are global. There are global supply chains. And to pick up the global activity of businesses that may source um, goods and services from a very substantial array of countries is an argument for a global uh, negotiation. Yep. And so we would like to do that. We're not going to uh, lessen our commitment to the regional and the bilateral forums, but we do think that a new pathway is the way to go, consistent with um, still high ambition, but let's get some confidence, get some results early, and once we prove to ourselves that we're capable after 10 years of doing that, it's just possible that there will be a newfound momentum. So we think that that's the right strategy. Well, that's a nice optimistic tone. Um, Pascal Ami, I know you have to leave uh, soon, and uh, you're on your way to Africa, so we're pleased about that um, from an African standpoint. Uh, but uh, I'd like to hear your views on, on, if you look down the road, let's take uh, uh, under the assumption that there was a successful conclusion of the Doha round. If you look forward a little bit, um, what kind of things do you think would um, make the WTO a more attractive location uh, for, for uh, these global, the, the purveyors of these global supply chains and indeed all uh, who look to the global uh, trading system uh, to raise their welfare? Well, I mean, I think this, this discussion has already answered this question. Huh? The paradox is not so much between bilateral and multilateral, it's between global value chains proliferating and bilateral agreements proliferating. This is where the paradox is. And what Karel uh, de Gort uh, said about bilateral are better because they are deeper, especially in the regulatory area, is where the potential problem lies. There is no problem in countries negotiating <coughs> bilaterally tariff reductions. Because at the end of the day, the more bilateral preferences you have, the less bilateral preferences you have. If India and US compromise India's bound tariff, ceiling tariff, let's say 40%, EU's ceiling tariff, let's say 4%, if they do a bilateral deal, they will compromise on 20% which, by the way, they refuse to do in the WTO. And that's a question for you guys, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> but why, why will EU do that? Why will EU do that? Because they will get the 20% before the others get it. So they have a preference. Now, of course, India will sign bilateral agreements with others. And the more India gives 20% to others, the more the EU preference of 20% will lose its value. So, multilaterally, multilaterally, that's not a problem. There is an asymptote, like in a curve, to bilateral trade opening tariff-wise, which is zero, which is the multilateral asymptote. So that's not the problem. Where is the problem? The problem is in deep regulatory convergence. If EU and India <laughs> adopt a common standard for telecom equipment bilaterally because that will be good for both your businesses and US uh, and Korea uh, adopt uh, bilateral standards for car emission and all this is just examples right? it's not uh, this will be a problem because at the end of the day you will scatter the marketplace with bilateral regulatory regimes which business will not like because it's diseconomies of scale. So this is where the problem lies. Now, does this mean that nothing can be done multilaterally? I 
totally agree with Gita. The problem for the moment is that you need a lot of political energy to do things multilaterally, and it's just not available. Short supply. <coughs> just like on climate change or currency arrangements or macroeconomic coordination. <coughs> Too bad for the years to come. Very low level of that. So the big deal will not be there because the big deal implies that this question which Ron and uh, Anand just mentioned, which is what's the right balance of obligations between developed and emerging countries, that's they can't find this because they don't have the necessary political energy to compromise. India will say, I'm a developing country, don't you ask me to take the same commitments as the US. US will say, sorry guys, you are now competing with us, uh, why should we accept such a difference in tariffs? And both of them have a, let's say, reasonably convincing argument. Huh? The problem is that when you've got two convincing arguments, the only way out is compromise. And for the moment, the political energy for compromise is not there. Now, what can we do? And we discussed that, including today. And I think the conclusion is that there are things that can be done multilaterally. Even if the big price is not available, for the reasons I just gave, there are areas where small, incremental, significant progress can be made. Starting, by the way, with WTO accessions, right? which is a way to extend the perimeter of rules. Short of changing them, extending the perimeter has a value. Using instruments like the Government Procurement Agreement. Yeah? After years and years of negotiation, in December, the members of the Government Procurement Agreement in WTO succeeded in reopening the issue and concluding a new deal, which will open more trade. So, these things are possible. And I'm quite convinced, after having heard everybody, including uh, ministers today, that if we leave aside the sort of big battle, big price for the moment, which doesn't mean we should have it in mind, there are areas where progress in a multilateral context can take place, and this is what we have to test in the coming month. But please do not expect trumpets and drums. Uh, in the present macroeconomic circumstances, which are not looking good, <coughs> Governance, governments will not trumpet this. Let's go to a sort of more quiet mode for some time, get things done, and then maybe the bigger price uh, will be doable. Any others who have ideas about how we get beyond this? Please. Yeah, I would have one thought. I think one common theme has been the political constraints each of us has to operate on to sell trade, but, but considering that, and I loved Craig's honesty and that the fact he was delayed because of the protests, he couldn't get here, but the, the elephant not in the room is the principles on which the statement trade is good for the world have not been visited in some time. And for the most part, even the way you phrased the question was, does doing bilateral agreements make it more difficult for presumptively the global supply chain than if we were to do it multilaterally. When the question is how do you convince that poor child in a village in India, in Lusaka, in Harlem to believe, why do you care? If it's all about making it easier for the global supply chain, you never build a political base of support that Anand Sharma has to have to go to a population that is struggling to understand how is this going to improve my life? Whereas I think we have to take advantage of the challenge of this forum, recognizing the transformation in our economy, to talk about trade differently. Yes, it's important for the supply chain, but the supply chain has to be relevant to how people live their lives. And that we empower consumers all over the world, making it easier for them to feed their families in a time of rising commodity prices and put oil on the table. We can create jobs. But if we don't change and attack the fundamental premise on which why we should do this in a global forum in which all of us have to give something in order to get something, then I think you never build that 
sort of global political consensus to make those very tough decisions. And then it becomes easier, frankly, to just do something practical and say, I can explain this to the American public, why I'm doing this with Korea, Colombia, Panama, versus why we continue to add to our balance of trade by signing on to agreements to which the American public believes there's no benefit for us. So well, I think I'm we need sorry. a more honest address assessment well, of why we're, who benefits from trade. Well, I'm sorry, by speaking of the supply chains, um, uh, I, I should have made it explicit that what we're actually talking about is how do we get the poor farmer in Africa to be part of the food supply chain to supply the large markets that are emerging, or the person who works in, in, in many different places around the world to be supplying in that chain uh, and therefore uh, enjoying productive labor. So uh, that's what I meant by the, the supply chains. Um, uh, uh, Anand, uh, you've been very patient, and then I'll come to you, Carl, uh, uh, because then I, I want to have some time at least for the audience. No, I want to make three short points. First, I didn't respond so far to the bilaterals and the plurilaterals. Bilaterals or plurilaterals are decisions which sovereign nation states make. It has been happening for a long time. Economic integration, regional in particular, started with NAFTA, North America, South America have had two. European Union is a reality. ASEAN is a very vibrant regional economic community. In Africa, there are seven RECs, the regional economic communities, which work under the overarching umbrella of the Africa Union. You mentioned about India negotiating. Yes, that's true. And Pascal, too, mentioned about our ongoing negotiations, which are complex and difficult. Negotiations, whether between two countries or between a regional economic community like European Union and India, they have been prolonged, complex, and you have to have patience and pragmatism guiding those negotiations. But the issue here is that if there is slow progress in the WTO negotiations, which was the only 21st century mandate after the Uruguay round, and is the longest any multilateral or global trade negotiations have ever taken. So that raises a fundamental question, that should those issues which be left, as Pascal Ami said, to the multilateral order and the multilateral organization, upholding the values or the principles which we all have accepted in GATT and WTO, be taken over by plurilaterals, my answer would be that multilateral pathway, even if there is a block, like I was saying earlier in the ministerial, Craig is a doctor, I'm not, but if the main artery is blocked, a good doctor will look at it that, okay, let's see that if it can be cleaned out and put a stent there, or then to take the heart out and do the bypass. So that's a larger issue. Government procurement, competition, these are the issues which should be within the domain of a multilateral regime. And the bilaterals and plurilaterals, otherwise which countries do, should supplement like the small streams moving what into a mighty river. What about investment? They should not. Yes, and investment. Shouldn't inve rules so of so inve investment should be part of the WTO. You see, I would it? say rules of investment, multilateral order. I'm not saying this not to suggest that countries will not engage with each other in plurilaterals. But at the same time, when we talk of a global trading order, that is what the mandate is, to correct the imbalances, to ensure that it is fair and balanced. Now, how we look at fair and balanced, there could be different perspectives. I would like to give one message to everyone, contrary to the prophets of doom, uh, without singling out which section, who are saying that this is dead, and, uh, well, there is a difficulty. There has been an impasse. Because there are issues on which different perspectives are there. That's why negotiations take place. But what we do regionally or by plurilaterally should not replace the multilateral system fundamentally because that would undermine the very credibility of a multilateral trading regime. And we all are convinced. And lastly, what I'm saying, that we have to bear in mind that we can 
look at what is doable, what can be harvested, and not sequentially, and use that as a building block towards the larger objective. Countries will eventually find, through negotiations, a middle ground. Okay. The developing countries have paid a price and will continue to pay a price, which is fair. But lastly, what I'll say before Pascal leaves, <laughs> is that it's not what we negotiate as the tariffs. The fact is that whether it was the GATT, the tariffs have come down. Even after that, we have unilaterally brought down our tariffs to an average, a national average of 15 percent. So that will keep on happening. But the fundamental issue is about the bound tariff and the applied tariff. The bound tariff and okay. applied tariff, that is the policy space which countries would need. At the same time, I, I don't foresee a situation where a bound tariff is, say, 30 percent. The yeah. countries will invoke the bound tariff unless and until there are compelling reasons to do so. So while there is no perfect solution, it, in search of a perfect solution, it will be a never-ending negotiation. We can at least have a fair solution Thank and find you. a middle ground. I, I want to turn, Carl, to Hood. You um, pioneered, as Europe, an effort to try to introduce some of these deeper integration issues into the WTO. Things like investment and competition policy. Now, um, at the end of the day, it seems to me that those are perfectly reasonable topics for a multilateral system, even though perhaps not all countries are ready for them. So is there a way forward to deal with this, on the one hand, drive for deeper integration, and on the other hand, the need for inclusivity? I believe that uh, we not only continue to need, but we even need more than in the past multilateral agreements because there are a number of topics that uh, are, are very difficult uh, to resolve at the bilateral level also. For example, the ones that you are mentioning about also about intellectual property rights, uh, about uh, services, uh, about investment. Investment is as important as trade, you know, for uh, the, uh, uh, the economic uh, system. Uh, and we can only address them at the multilateral level. What I believe is that to get there, we first have uh, to lift a precondition, and that's reaching an agreement on an LDC package. Uh, and that's, I think we should uh, try to have it as broad as possible, uh, duty-free, quota-free, problems with cotton, you have uh, also export uh, competition, fishery um, uh, subsidies, uh, and it's, it's almost a stepping stone to trade facilitation because that can benefit to developed, developing and also LDC countries. And that's, I think, what we should do, lift that precondition because it's only if we manage to do that that I believe that at the multilateral level we will be able to address a number of new and very uh, important uh, topics. Um, the world is, is changing very rapidly, and um, the, uh, the topics that are discussed in the WTO are not uh, changing at the same pace. So uh, we, we, we get lost in that. Uh, we, we are still talking largely about the problems of, I wouldn't say the past, but in any, fa any case, not the problems of the future. Uh, you, you know why it's stalled in, in, uh, in Geneva. It was because of subsistence agriculture and the special safeguard mechanism. Uh, those are the kind of things we should resolve within the LDC package so that we can move to, uh, for example, investment to uh, the global uh, supply chain where you see developing and developed countries working together to get to a product. Thank you. Um, we only have a very short period of time, but um, if you have a question from the audience, uh, please uh, indicate, and we can take a few, and then I'll ask the panelists as a group to respond. So anyone want to ask? A question here at the back, sir. Yeah. Uh, a simple one. Faisal Islam, Channel 4 News. How's the EU-India deal going? Okay, let's just hold that one. Yeah, others? Please. Uh, Daniel Gross, Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. I'm a bit confused because I hear about all these supply chains 
but that should tell us if uh, in, uh, large enterprises are able to integrate, then maybe barriers to trade are not that important. So um, I would like to hear from the business representative, what is really the problem in expanding the supply chains? They already exist. Is it a problem of tariff barriers, other regulatory barriers? Or is it more a question of the industrial organization in your partner countries that you have reliable partners that can produce according to certain standards which you set in your industry? So it is more governmental action that is needed or more an industrial uh, backbone which has to exist in a country before it can really participate in the global supply chain. Okay, and uh, let's just take one more. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, I'm Aaron back with Dow Jones. Uh, I would just like to ask about some comments at this forum yesterday by, uh, the, uh, uh, by Timothy Geithner from the United States. Uh, who spoke about China's state-led economic model and how this poses a challenge to the global trade system. This is actually a relatively new rhetorical turn in the trade debate. And I wonder um, what the panelists think this implies for the negotiations on multilateral, uh, multilateral trade negotiations. Okay, I think thank that... You. Thank you. Um, so... U.S. E, um, um, sorry, India, EU, how, how's the progress going? Is that symbolic? Uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's not the same as if uh, uh, Mrs. Merkel is looking at Mrs. Sarkozy. It's not the same. <laughs> you have a better understanding. <laughs> no, um, well, we, we, are, we are making steady progress, but um, um, there are still a number of problems that have to be resolved. Uh, I'm, I'm very confident that we get to an agreement that, it's, uh, that it will be uh, a deep and comprehensive one and that it will also uh, change over time uh, India in a way that it also becomes more attractive for uh, other trading partners. I mean, it, it's also to a certain extent going to change the morphology of, of, of India, for example, with respect to services, and that's not only important for, for Europe, it's also important for other, uh, for other uh, parts of the world. But uh, you should not underestimate that kind of negotiations um, because it's about, uh, also about confronting cultures, you know, and, and, and finding a common solution. So you have to put in a lot of political capital and that's, that's effectively what is missing at the multilateral level, but not at the level of the ambassadors who are negotiating in, uh, in Geneva. They are working uh, like hell. I wouldn't even say at our level. It's at the level of uh, what we call our leaders, you know. The G20 that comes together is all the time producing a very nice declaration that uh, we should come to an agreement in, in Geneva, and then they don't give any mandate to their ministers or to their ambassadors. That's what is really happening. And you are not facing that in, in discussions bilaterally because you only start that kind of negotiations if there is the political capital. I think that's one of the big differences. Anand Shamda, very briefly, please. We are moving forward. I entirely agree with Carol de Wood that... Uh, our negotiators are meaningfully engaged, and both of us periodically keep on exchanging notes, and if required, we both intervene to see that how they can fast forward. It's complex. There are few ends which we, or gaps which we have to close, and depending on how ambitious it is, it will be fairly broad-based and deep, and it will have positive spin-offs, uh, not only for e EU and for India, but also perhaps in a global context, when you have a grim economic backdrop, uh, continuing slowdown, uh, job losses, uh, the only way for the global economy is to remain stable, robust, and to keep on growing is by engaging with each other, and that's why these processes plus the multilateral becomes an imperative. Thank you. Uh, would you like to comment? Sure. Um, Look, if you're already operating your global supply chains, why do we need these trade agreements? Because we need, we need a level playing field. On one side, uh, countries, economies, which have to have access, as, as you said, uh, to, to the global supply chain, if there is no playing field, their difficulty is much, much higher. 
On the other hand, uh, when we see large economies such as China, and I'll, I'll make just a quick point here about the BRICS. The BRICS are more like a political group because they, those are four very, very different countries in all aspects. So uh, the real powerhouse threatening on the, on, the, on the industrial side, the whole world, is, is China. Brazil has a $50 billion deficit of industrial goods in its trade balance. So Brazil is actually, is, uh, the concern is about the domestic market. Not, we're not being actually too much aggressive on the international market. So uh, uh, the level playing field, some, some governance mechanism over those large economies, Russia and China in particular, uh, level playing field is what they should seek for. Access and making sure the rules are the same for everybody. And uh, in the end, the business will always be seeking efficiency, productivity, and obviously uh, based on, on technical standards, always. Well, that's a great segue, and I have to get Ron Kirk to uh, tell us, uh, 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 Tim Geithner, it was, cl it, it was said uh, that these uh, state trading companies are a challenge to the uh, trading system. Uh, could, you, could you elaborate on that or answer that question? Well, I think Mr. Geithner spoke fairly clearly um, in terms of his um, recitation of the problem. I would only say that not just state-owned enterprises, but it speaks a little bit to what I think I heard Carl say earlier in terms of the difficulty of what we're doing now. A lot of what we're dealing with in Doha is being with a trade model that served us well for the last 25, 30 years, but you didn't have the dominance of state-owned enterprises involved in trade. You didn't have the proliferation of different regulatory regimes and sanitary and phytosanitary regimes. Um, we never heard of the email. There was no blogging. There was no such thing as Facebook. There was no such thing as Twitter and the implications for business, the implications for government in terms of control of how we do business. There are so many more elements that can frustrate trade beyond tariffs and duties, which Anand is right. Uh, many of the obstacles to trade now have nothing to do with tariffs and duties. And so I think what, uh, at least in our case, the United States was honestly saying uh, that we have to begin to inject some honesty into how governments can otherwise tilt the playing field and deny our friend here the same thing every American business, every one of these men and women in the audience basically asked us, just tell us what the rules are and give me some assurance government can't come up with some more creative way to put their thumb on the scale. And I will be honest, one of the reasons we are so bullish on this Trans-Pacific Partnership with New Zealand and Australia and others, we think it's time that trade agreements have to reflect the reality of doing business today. They have to be much more nimble. We have to be willing to recognize that business moves so many more times faster than government, but that we ought to be able to flexible enough to do that. But in the case of state-owned enterprises, we just can't ignore that they don't exist. We shouldn't be afraid of having an honest conversation about it and coming up with the way to moderate that, and this is where the World Trade Organization can really demonstrate its vitality and its need and how we regulate and govern that. So, and, and, and finally, because I've had a number of you approach me and people have said, oh my God, the United States wants a trade war with China. We do not want a trade war with China. China has very quickly become one of our top four trading partners. It is our number one agricultural trading partner. We think it is a great thing that China has gone through the explosive growth that it has. That's why we invited them into the World Trade Organization. We want to see the same for India and Brazil and Africa. That's how we credential trade. But it doesn't work if you only take from the system and believe you can deprive the rest of us the access to the markets that we so freely grant yours. Okay. Um, uh, Craig Emerson, you have half a minute. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to round out the discussion on plurilateral um, and the role of plurilateral negotiations. Plurilateral negotiations can be uh, entirely consistent with the multilateral trading system. The information technology agreement, the government procurement agreement, both have proved dynamic, both have uh, enlisted uh, increasing membership over time. And my view is that uh, we shouldn't pre-negotiate the negotiations. Let's allow uh, groups to form uh, see what momentum uh, is achieved by groups looking at these individual elements. It does prevent hostage taking where someone says, well, we don't have a fundamental problem with this, but we're linking it to something to which it is unrelated and so therefore won't agree to progress on 
the primary issue. So I can see a facilitative role for plurilateral negotiations that ultimately advance the multilateral system. So I, I think that's a great point. Uh, when I, what I take away from our discussion today is, firstly, there's some, some modest hope, perhaps, for reaping something still from the Doha round, some sort of forms of early harvest. Um, but looking down the road, there is a fundamental challenge, which I think is finding the right balance between this drive on the one hand for deeper integration, which is clearly coming from the operations of the global supply chains, and yet, on the other hand, a legitimate need by many countries for policy space, which we also heard referred to. So it's a search for some kind of balance. And I think the real challenge is, can we create a multilateral system? Can we do in a multilateral system um, uh, an approach which can actually balance these two? And, and can we incorporate, perhaps not for all, but within the multilateral context, some of those deeper initiatives patterned after the plurilateral agreements, uh, which Craig Emerson pointed out, have been successful, uh, starting with just a few and then growing to meet the needs of many. So, ladies and gentlemen, please uh, uh, join me in, in thanking this panel. We uh, apologize for not having enough time. We apologize for the interruptions, but I still think we've been able to touch on the major challenges that face the trading system. So, uh, please join me in thanking our panel.